Well, hello everyone and welcome to the session How Women Negotiate Differently. My name is Aleksandra Skonieczna. I'm a chairperson of WFWPA Poland. Professionally, I am a business trainer and a clinical psychologist. So I'll try to combine those two perspectives while moderating the session. Uh, recently, I read in a Forbes article that compared with men, women tend to be more cooperative, empathetic, and ethical. I think these are all the qualities that lead to achieving more lasting, sustainable solutions, both in politics, on the international arena, and in business. So I have witnessed personally, while working for over 20 years in the NGO, as well as in business sectors, that women are actually very good at many things that men do, but we, in addition, excel at motivating, at guiding, at nurturing talent. Well, I think women's role is even more crucial because we are raising future leaders in our families. So when we negotiate like such mundane issues with our children and partners, husbands, yeah, such as like whether to eat breakfast in the morning or not, when to go to sleep, when to put your phone away, uh, like how to coexist peacefully with your siblings, with your friends. When we negotiate those things with our children, we in fact model how in their adult life they would build their relationships, how they would communicate with others, whether they would be able to learn to trust, whether they would feel capable and empowered, whether they would be willing to embrace people of various ethnical, religious and many other backgrounds. I personally was born and raised in Russia and lived there till I was in my 20s. Later, I married a Polish guy and almost 30 years ago moved to Poland, where I've lived ever since with like my husband and five now teenage and adult kids. And let me tell you, Poland and Russia are not friends. Yeah? Both countries have had very difficult relationships for centuries, yeah? which has exacerbated greatly recently due to the war waged in Ukraine. So for almost 30 years, I tried to implement various projects, various initiatives, helping to promote better understanding between Poland and Russia, helping people to heal their hearts. In totally fruitless efforts, they seem now, like looking from the today's perspective, yeah, taking into account the current events. At least I do hope that my efforts raising children capable of overcoming the national prejudices, prejudices won't be in vain. Yeah, at least in this, I hope I'll succeed. So recently I started thinking that in fact, we need much more women in politics, like as presidents, as prime ministers, so that such decisions as, for example, declaring a war cannot be taken without us. So we are half of the world's population. Yeah? The majority of experts working in caring professions are women. So actually, we are and we will be dealing with the aftermath of the, tra of the tragedies in Ukraine, in Palestine, in Syria, in Cyprus, Nicaragua, and many other countries. Yeah? So women We'll be treating wounded, we'll be treating patients with PTSD, we'll teach children they had to flee their countries, and so on. So, so I suggest, so let's discuss today, what are our strengths as women, how women negotiate differently, and how we can negotiate a more influential role for ourselves in our society. So we have a distinguished panel today. And um, 
so uh, let me introduce uh, briefly. So now I'll just tell the names and later I'll introduce them more in detail. So today uh, we'll have with us Madame Elsie Christophia, uh, the first lady of Cyprus uh, between 2008 and uh, 2013. We also have with us today uh, Her Excellency Dr. Liri Birisha, uh, First um, Lady of Albania, who will also speak uh, today. Uh, we also have Honorable Helena Kokkarinen, uh, who was EU Special Representative to Ukraine in 2016-2017. And also we'll have today with us Dr. Tanya Paffenholtz. Uh, director of the Inclusive Peace Institute from Geneva. So without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to our first speaker, uh, Madame Elsie Christophia, First Lady of Cyprus. Uh, Her Excellency Elsie Christophia, a wife of former President of the Republic of Cyprus, uh, Dimitris Christophias. Uh, she has been active with several humanitarian and cultural NGOs and serves currently as a member of the Central Committee of Akel Party. From what I understand, Madame Christophe is not uh, present now, but she has recorded her speech. Could I ask please to show us the recording of the speech now? Fellow women activists in the struggle for the prevalence of world peace. Let me first of all welcome the initiative taken by the Women's Federation for World Peace to organize today's online discussion within the context of the anniversary of the 21st of September, established by the UN as the International Day of Peace. In today's conditions where the law of the mighty prevails, together with the flagrant violation of international law, the double standard policies being pursued and the machinations of the US, Britain and NATO seeking to put the UN under their control, machinations that have dealt a serious blow to international relations, the resistance of the peace-loving forces and their militant mobilization to counter this extremely dangerous state of affairs is imperative. We women who bring children into the world, the builders of the future of humanity, are pained to experience the tragic consequences of the war mongering tactics of the imperialist powers against the peaceful coexistence of the peoples. Fully aware of our share of responsibility, we have always resisted these policies that undermine the work and purposes of the UN and which are leading humanity to devastation and destruction. The peoples of Palestine, Syria, Cyprus, Ukraine, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Bolivia and beyond have witnessed what the implementation of such policies that violate international law mean. On the basis of these policies, Cyprus has been de facto divided since 1974. Peace negotiations started immediately after the 1974 ceasefire. From the very beginning, Cypriot women from all communities communities were actively involved in mobilizations demanding a peaceful, just and sustainable solution of the Cyprus problem. The tragic events in 1974, the coup d'etat of the Greek junta in Okabi and the subsequent Turkish invasion, essentially the implementation of a well-engineered part plan on the part of NATO's US imperialism, which resulted in the forced displacement from villages and towns of thousands of people from all communities, the loss of their loved ones, many missing persons, the humiliating rape of the body and soul of many women by the invaders. To this day, 48 years later, Turkey is still occupying 37% of the territory of the Republic of Cyprus. In the face of this reality, the women of Cyprus have had a dynamic presence on an equal footing in the struggles waged by the entire Cypriot people for the reconstruction of their country and the provision of economic support towards their families. Cypriot women made history with the organization of mass mobilizations such as the magnificent Women's March in 1975 with the participation of thousands of women together with hundreds of representatives from women's organizations from abroad.
Since then, the Women's Mass Movement of Cyprus has organized numerous events and participated in all the anti-occupation mobilizations of the Cypriot people, as well as in meetings for approachment with our Turkish Cypriot compatriots for a peaceful solution of the Cyprus problem and the reunification of Cyprus and its people on the basis of a bizonal, bicommunal federation with political equality as provided by the relevant UN resolutions. However, today, the escalation of tensions internationally and particularly in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Middle East and North Africa may adversely affect the prospects for a solution of the Cyprus problem. There is no other alternative other than the resumption of negotiations under the auspices of the UN and more specifically from where the talks had remained at Kranz Montana, namely on the basis of the 2014 joint declaration that Guterres framework of 30th, 30th of June 2017 and the acquis of convergences that had been recorded. The solution must provide for an end to the occupation, the withdrawal of the occupying troops, and an end to the colonization of occupied areas, the restoration of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the Republic of Cyprus, as well as the restoration of the unity of the state, the people, the institutions, and the economy, the abolition of any intervention rights and the anachronistic regime of guarantees the safeguarding of the human rights and fundamental freedoms of all Cypriots, including the right of return and utilization of the property of the refugees and lawful owners, the complete demilitarization of the Republic of Cyprus. The comprehensive solution of the Cyprus problem, the content of which must be agreed at the leadership level, should subsequently be put before the people through the holding of simultaneous referenda in the two communities. Taking all the above into account, Cypriot women from all communities continue to raise their voices for peace, social justice, the reunification of their island, as well as for all their rights, including their effective participation and integration in the peace processes of the, for the solution of the Cyprus problem. Besides, this is what is indicated in the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. It has been proved through social, daily social life and practice that women who make up about half of the population of each country not only do not lack any qualifications, but frequently demonstrate that when given the right opportunities, they can emerge as leaders in their field of activity. This is precisely why it is essential to make use of NGOs that engage with women's issues and to take all the necessary measures so as to provide opportunities for women to actively participate in processes and decision-making centers. This is why it is imperative to provide funding for community initiatives such as projects and educational programs to all communities, Greek Cypriots, Turkish Cypriots, Armenians, Maronites, and Latins, in an effort to enhance their contribution to peace-building processes. It is imperative to provide financial assistance in creating a network between women across the island to address common social issues such as health, pandemic gender-based violence and unemployment among women as well as deteriorating social and environmental conditions. To change attitudes with regards to position of women in Cypriot society, the media and social media outlets can be used they must comply with the re relevant code of conduct and revise the way they present women, especially in connection with the Cyprus issue. Finally, it is imperative that pre pressure is exerted on the authorities of countries to implement the action plan jointly elaborated by the Technical Committee on Gender Equality and which has been included in the latest UN report on Cyprus in January 2022. The aim of this plan is to harness the women's factor both in the procedure of the solution of the Cyprus problem and to ensure women's rights after the solution.
Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. In her speech, Her Excellency, Madam Christofia showed us the context of the division in Cyprus. She has shown how it has influenced local women belonging to various ethnic groups. She spoke about the influence of international actors that fuel military conflicts. And she mentioned specifically some ongoing conflicts in the world. We actually, in the Women Federation, uh, believe that we need to make the voices of mothers and sisters of local women organizations really heard on the international arena. Uh, that is why Women's Federation for World Peace have been promoting the Global Women's Peace Network that promotes peace leadership based on the feminine aspect of human nature needed to ensure lasting peace and prosperity for the future generations. So now, uh, I would like to give the floor to Her Excellency Dr. L Liri Berisha. In 2008, Dr. Berisha founded the Mother Teresa Cultural Foundation. In 2009, she was named Woman of the Year by the Women's Information Network. Uh, her specific area of interest, as I understand, are autistic children. And she was one of the first persons in Albania to start introducing various educational and treatment programs aid at children uh, with autism. So, Dr. Liri Birisha, the floor is yours. Honored co panelists and participants in this exceptional virtual conference, I feel not only honored but also privileged that today, within the celebrations, of the International Day of Peace, proclaimed by the General Assembly of United Nations, along with other distinguished ladies, to partake in the mitigation of a painful reality that, since more than eight months ago, has troubled not only Ukraine, but the whole world. I fully wish that with our messages we may influence even slightly to illuminate the beautiful road of peace, tranquility, because, as experts underline, mm -hmm. when women take part in peace negotiations, the opportunities for a sustainable peace agreement increase. As the First Lady of my own country, and even after this important role, I strive to put women together in missions of charity and in many projects where their transformative power and strength was welcomed and appreciated with enthusiasm. But not only that, I've tried to urge capable and wise women to be part of important decision-making processes of my country, since where there is the voice of women, the voice of conflict is diminished. For more than 20 years, I led the Albanian Children Foundation, whose focus are children with disorders of autism spectrum, while it generally supports children's health needs and those with socio-economic deficiencies. I'm not exaggerating when saying that I began the fight with this kind of disease in my country from nothing, while today, thanks to the many efforts of devoted people that were involved in this cause, we have made it to have standardised identification and treatment protocols, to have more trained professionals from our foundation, more mothers and fathers ready to support their children. In this path, the strongest voice of our cause were the mothers. In every media communication, in every conference, in every celebration or event, mothers of children with autism are still today the power that shakes public opinion, overdue politics, wrong and negligent mindsets in policy making. In order to encourage as much as possible the inclusion of influential women in the autism efforts, often I have included in witnessing concrete evidence of what children of autism spectra are capable of doing when they are supported with therapy and regularly followed up. Women from diplomatic missions in Albania. They have closely seen and touched their beautiful handmade works, watched their performances in various fields of art and were moved which then crossed the borders of my country and became messages for more support in this endeavour in the countries where they came from. I cannot fail to mention the many efforts we made for thalassemic children, 
thanks to the negotiations with the political representatives. Since 2005, we made it to include the drug Exjade in the list of reimbursable drugs, which was seen as extremely expensive, even for the budgets of high-income countries, not to mention a country like Albania of that time. We negotiated strongly on behalf of children's health, and today, thanks to that effort, their quality of life has improved significantly. The foundation I preside takes all efforts in the name of well-being and life, and in this regard, women are the most powerful engines that put the mechanisms of a society to work. I think that a country's efforts should be closely linked to improving the well-being of women and girls. The better they feel, the better a society is, and this is critical in the field of conflict prevention. A woman's hand on another woman's shoulder is the best mechanism to strengthen and promote women's leadership in our workplaces or in the organisations where we work. It is also the best tool to challenge stereotypes and gender roles in the family or society. The world must be in alert to maintain the fair ratio of women and men participation in building societies as women are flexible and safer for all. In these turbulent and far from serene times, women's missions make more sense than ever. Their involvement in matters of national security is a must. All Albanian women have been active advocates of peace at all times. They share the blood and heart of Mother Teresa and they plant her seed everywhere when it comes to ending conflicts, kindling hope and promoting peace. I wish and hope very much that the world will be enriched by the wisdom of women, grow by their wit and become safer by trusting them. Thank you. I think here you find the Roy, Professor Marin of the panel, you find the Roy organism in the conference at Kajstar on Sisma. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, Dr. Liri Berisha. Uh, so Dr. Berisha told us about the latest developments in her country, but uh, she also told us about very practical steps that were undertaken under her guidance by the foundation that she established, aimed at educating and treating children with autism in Albania. I think true nature of democracy in any country is demonstrated by our attitude to vulnerable groups, to which of, into which, of course, we may include adults and children with autism. Yeah. So true democracy also is demonstrated by the quality of our efforts that we make to empower representatives of the vulnerable groups. And I've already mentioned, yeah, so the majority of uh, professionals and caring, uh, of experts in caring professions are women, yeah, so we know actually, we learn how to empower people. Okay, so far we've heard representatives from the south of Europe. I think now is the time for the northern Europe. So I'd like to give the floor to Honorable Helena Kokkarinen. EU Special Representative to Ukraine in 2016-2017, who I hope will tell us about the Nordic perspective on what makes the difference when women are involved. So, Honorable Helena Kokarinen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. And dear co-speakers, dear participants and also a special, special thanks to Dr. Jacobi. Your every word was like gold. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to highlight that Finland is fully committed to peace building. Under article of the constitution of Finland, Finland pledges to participate in international cooperation for peace and human rights and social, societal development. The commitment coming from the constitution has been mainstreamed through the whole society, the government, the parliament, the ministries, the institution, and especially 
the non-governmental organizations, so civil society, which is one of the most important players. Finland has a strong focus on promoting women's ownership and participation in peace processes in line with UN Resolution 1325, which has been so many times now mentioned here. Uh, concrete action to implement, implement the resolution is set out in Finland's national plan, action plan on women, peace and security. The progress of the action plan is followed by an uh, 1325 monitoring group coordinated by the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, which reports then to the parliament on the plan's implementation. Finland implements its responsibilities in peace mediation as part of an international network, CMI, uh, Peace Foundation of President Ahtisaari, has a special role in peacemaking. CMI works with many major organizations to develop peaceful, peaceful solution to existing violent conflicts and to prevent others. Sustain, sustainable peace is at the heart of CMI's work. The, I could say that the legacy of President Ahtisari is strong and often shows us the way to act. Finland's Women's Mediators Network was established in uh, 2015. The network consist of, consists of 16 leading peace and security professionals. Their expertise ranges from civilian crisis management, management and international law to diplomacy and mediation. CMI is the oper operative partner of the Finnish network. The network is currently headed by the director of VISE, Wider Security Network, which is a civil society network bringing together Finnish NGOs and parliamentary groups, political parties, to work together to promote peace building, crisis management and conflict prevention, both nationally and internationally. And of course, Finland's Women's Mediators Network is a part of the Nordic Women Mediators Network, established as well in 2015. It compri comprises the National Women's Mediators Network in all North Nordic countries. The network aims to bring together Nordic women who have experience of mediation tasks or peace talks and to discuss different ways of training, one of the most important, mentoring and actively developing women's competencies and ways of recruiting them to mediation tasks. But then the title, why women uh, uh, are negotiating differently. First of all, that why women should be a part of negotiation teams. What makes the difference when women are involved? These are the questions we females are hearing all the time. When discussed these topics so often, I have come to few quite simple conclusions. First of all, the fact which has been mentioned here at least twice already is that the half of the world's population are females. Unfortunately, this is a poor fact, but should not be disregarded like every note. Quite often it is left outside. It is a fact and it's a poor fact. Secondly, if all the members of the negotiation, negotiation teams are males, most probably peace agreements are lacking some most important aspects for a sustainable peace. During a conflict, usually the men are the ones who are fighting on the front line, while women are the ones taking care of the society. Uh, behind the front line. Women are the ones taking care of children, healthcare, community welfare, even labor. But too many times, females and children are also the victims of the conflict. Uh, like I have 
ironically considered every now and then in this kind of situation, in peace negotiations, negotiation, uh, men are taking up the question of weapons, disarmament, demilitarization. While women could be the, the ones taking up uh, all the societal issues, how to implement reintegration, how to develop healthcare or social benefits, how to get child fighters back to school and so on. To bring together these different aspects and viewpoints, a sustainable and lasting peace agreement can be negotiated. And this is, I consider, the second fact that there are different uh, viewpoints, different aspects, and taking those together, the peace agreement could be much, much more sustainable. And in the end, I could tell you my own example to negotiate, especially as a women, woman. And when the first municipality elections were implemented in Kosovo after the conflict, which ended 99 in, in uh, uh, June, and I started to work in, in Afghanistan at the beginning of August 99 and 2000, there were the, the first municipal elections. I was acting in that time as a municipal administrator in the Chan, the Chani municipality. Uh, the uh, elections went well, but the outcome was a full, a full of problems. Two political parties had reached that much votes that the both parties were able to stop the normal development of the municipality. The winner could have taken all the main posts, mayor, directors, etc. But the other party had members enough in the assembly to boycott the implementation of the municipal statute. One month I discussed with the party leaders without any progress. I inv invited them to my office. I visited their offices. We, we were making a meeting in the cafeterias, etc. but no progress, not at all. Um, I had before that uh, worked in Finland in refugee issues. And especially I had been, I had been working with uh, Albanian refugees from Kosovo. And I had already lived more than one year in, in Kosovo. So knowing something about the society culture. So I invited the party leaders, all of them, all of them former UCK fighters and quite young men. When they came to my home, I sat on the coach. And while talking, I started my passion, crochetting. In the Albanian culture, and especially in the countryside, men are the heads of the family outside, but at home, inside the walls of the whole building, females and especially grandmothers were the ones who had the power inside. And there I was like a sitting granny at home. Not a single one of the of the party leaders could say anything against what I was proposing. And the result was that we were able to reach an agreement which was signed by all of us and saved in the safety of the municipality. That was the time. I really realized that I was using myself as a woman in the negotiator and also the how to say the skill of culture sensitivity. There are a lot to understand what kind of skills you need to negotiate. It's not a question of the difference between a man or a woman, but the females, they can bring with them different kind of aspects and viewpoints. That's the most important, but otherwise, 
you should have a lot of different kinds of skills. Thank you. That was my part. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kokkarinen, for your very, I'm quoting actually one of the messages on the chat, one for your very clear, practical, experience-based message and conclusions. Uh, yes, and I really enjoyed uh, listening how you shared about, I'd say, leading practices in the Nordic region and Finland how you promote uh, women's ownership and participation in peace processes and mediation. And you also specifically mentioned yeah, the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security, and how you contribute to this as well. Um, you also actually mentioned very practical reasons explaining why women should be part of any negotiating team. And I really enjoyed your example of how you negotiated with all those Albanian males sitting on a couch and crocheting. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. So now it's time to move from Finland to Switzerland. And uh, uh, today in our session, the last but not the least is Dr. Sanja Paffenholz. Uh, she is a director of Inclusive Peace Institute in Geneva. So Dr. Puffinholz has 30 years of experience as both an academic and a policy practice advisor. She is actually internationally renowned for her work uh, in support of peace and political transition process worldwide, focusing on mediation, peace building and sustainable outcomes. So Dr. Puffinholz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you hear me well. Um, I'm thanking, first of all, for the invitation. Special thanks, I think, also goes to our dear moderator, to all the speakers, and also especially to Caroline Hanshin for inviting me. I'm speaking to you from Kenya. So I'm in Nairobi, where it's maybe equally cold than in Switzerland. And I'm also maybe let you know what's my perspective. I'm speaking to you both as, as a woman as an expert, as a researcher, but also as somebody who has worked in many, many peace processes and negotiations. And I think I have seen many women in negotiations, even of course, I have seen many more men in negotiations, that goes without saying. And I had looked at the title and was wondering, is that the title? How do women negotiate differently? And I really spent some time yesterday thinking about, do women really negotiate differently? Or... Is the question maybe the wrong one? Is the question maybe rather how are negotiations and peace processes different when women are taking part? And I think uh, the previous speakers have already highlighted that. And I wanted to also share my experiences and give you some ideas from my personal experiences in these processes. First of all, I think what has been said, we as women have a number of assets men just simply don't have. And, but what, we, what I see a lot in the discussion, especially on the women, peace and security agenda is talking about everything we don't have. We don't have access. We are not enough of them. We have, so it's a lot of negativity around why we are disadvantaged in all this. Instead of saying, we have so much power and we have so much to say. And why is it like that? It is like that. For me, the first thing has actually really to do with power. Interestingly, I have met the experiences, for example, in the Middle East, in extremely patriarchic societies, there's often an argument from the international community, you have to have a male mediator. And my experience was actually the contrary, because when you have a male in a male dominated um, environment, the man is exposed to power games. And everything around centers around how can we sort of battle this man? They don't do this with a woman. With a woman, they think, okay, if you come in as a woman, and I'm sure Helena has these experiences as well, you are respected when you have a title, when you are the formal mediator, when you have a role, you are respected. And because you're respected, they take you serious, but they don't play the power games with you because they don't know how to do it, because they have simply no experience how to play with women. So 
I think that's a huge advantage. And for me, that speaks to having not just women in negotiation delegations, but having more and more lead mediators as women and chief negotiators as women, because it makes it much more easier. That's one thing. The other thing is, um, I think we as women can play with motherhood. And I think Helena made this very good example is coming in as mother or grandmother or even daughter, whatever, we can relate to these roles. And who can say no to a mother or a grandmother? You can bring people together in a very different way. Um, I have been in contact with a lot of men and um, they were just stuck. I was just recently in a context actually in Eastern Europe and people were yelling at each other and just yelling, yelling, yelling. I was there with a colleague. He was very shocked. And I said like, well, no, don't worry. Let them yell because they need to get it out. And then at a certain stage, I was just clapping into my hands and said, are you done? Can we just start talking? And this is this kind of, I would almost say, women authority. Because if a man does it, you interfere in this power game. If I do it, it's like, okay, 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 mommy is saying that, let's listen. I know this sounds stereotype, but I think we should not make this theoretical things about not essentializing women, stereotype. We should just use every asset we have. And that's an asset, just use it. The other thing is, I think what also previous speakers already said is um, when women are in peace talks, and as I'm sitting in Kenya, let me talk about Kenya, when Kenya had... Uh, sort of the very violent elections, which we at this moment just passed another election very peacefully. And the very violent elections in um, 2007 8, um, yes, there were women on the panel, but there was also a women coalition that was sort of outside of the talks, pushing for getting points on the agenda. And as previous speakers mentioned, this were different points, but there were also similar points. We should not forget that. Women equally pushed for having a government of national unity to give the country a perspective of inclusion, but the different points were indeed that women pushed much more for having a separate agreement that would address the humanitarian crisis and human suffering, and managed also to put in gender-based violence and provisions to address gender-based violence, and had really much more perspective, how do we end the suffering while men had more tendency, let's, let's fix the political first. So that was one thing. But women also had this longer term perspective. It is not enough if we have a political deal. And very often when I'm with male dominated delegations, it's all about ceasefire, yes, more and more, but it's all about the politics. When do we get the political deal? What kind of power deal do we get? But it's a very limited talk about how do we envision the society after the war? What is this dream of the new country we want to have? And women are much better at that, to thinking ahead, because we have to. I mean, it's, it's kind of, I'm, I, I really also don't want to be like a binary because there are so many men who would probably also do that. But I think why the men who have maybe also this thinking, they are often not in politics. They maybe have other professions because they may be also not like the games that are going on. So it's not only about let's get more sort of women in, it's get more humans in that think in a more human direction. I think that is it. And maybe as women, we are automatically more trained to do that. And um, that's not only because we are mothers and sisters and daughters. I think it's also because we have been more fighting for our roles and we are not we have not been given automatically power that's why we automatically think more about the more powerless because we can more associate and i think there's various reasons and so what i've also observed in many talks is the much more constructive engagement it's really interesting so it, it has happened to me several times when I was in, in, in negotiations where suddenly there was a majority of women and we all looked at each other and were a little bit astonished. How come? How was that happening? And what happened is we were like talking substance. People disagreed, of course, but it was substance focused. And often in the breaks, we were joking and saying, oh my God, if that would be men, we would be much more on positions. 
and, and politics. And we would not really focus deeply on the substance. So lucky that there are more women so we can end faster and more productive. So again, these are all stereotypes, but funnily, often these stereotypes are confirmed in reality. And I think what it shows also to me, and that makes me a little bit sad is if we are women, and we build on motherhood, we, I mean, I have two, I have two sons. So it's also my responsibility to make human beings out of my sons that will not have that same behavior. But we know it's not easy because we are not the only ones influencing them. So I, I really agree with all the, with the previous speaker. Education is key. We, if we, we can talk about big politics, the perspectives, Maybe to, to finalize, for me, it's really another, to, I wanted to end up with a sort of different perspective also on the whole peace talk, women, peace and security agenda. In my view, we are all pretty much stuck on let's get more women in. And um, at Inclusive Peace, my organization, we have done a couple of years back a big study also that was uh, done uh, together with UN Women on making women count, stop counting women. And I think that is still true. It is really about the quality of the engagement, but it's also not only about inclusive processes, but we at Inclusive Peace look a lot into now is how do we create conditions for inclusive outcomes? How do we create pathways to more inclusive societies? Because what is it worth if we had like in Yemen, a super inclusive, national dialogue and then we have the war starting and we get exclusion again we have to think the moment when we negotiate we have to think already what conditions do we can support do we need to create in order to create milestones and pathways to inclusive societies because that's what it is all about and here women and men can equally contribute but sometimes i think the men they need a little bit more help and we should just help them more, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pappenholz. Really, I think brilliant piece, brilliant analysis on women's strengths in negotiations. And I think I really liked your idea that our strength is the newness effect, yeah, that men just don't know how to play power games with women. Yeah, and uh, yeah, in a sense, also you mentioned they are conditioned to listen to elder motherly figures yeah, so of course we could use it but uh, seriously speaking I really think uh, you mentioned a critical issue which is a long-term perspective that women tend to take into account more I think than women for various reasons that you mentioned all as well yeah and uh, that, yes, this long-term perspective is something that should really be taken into account during the negotiations, yeah, so that we can build this inclusive society that actually I think we all are dreaming about. That's why we're here, yeah. So our session has been very long, but maybe we still have time for one or two brief questions. Uh, if yes, actually, uh, there's a question uh, from one of the participants I guess like it's not addressed to anyone. So maybe you'd like to, uh, anyone who'd like to take it. Uh, it actually, it's about women's oppression based on culture and religion. Uh, so I think it's more about customs yeah, and how they influence women's role. So what steps can women leaders take to address women oppression issues connected to culture and religion? So whoever would like to take the floor, please. Do it. I mean, I can, let me see. No, yeah, I can just quickly add something because I'm just back. Actually, I just an hour ago, I came back from a gathering with religious leaders. Hmm. There were 90% men, there were two women. Um, but the interesting thing is when this discussion comes up, these men that were sitting there, and it was about focusing what religious leaders and the continent can do in a particular crisis in Africa. Um, it was a confidential meeting with very senior leaders. They were very often talking about women, actually. They were also saying, we need to integrate the women of faith. We need to get them voice 
we need to do that. Why is it like that? It's because these are very, I would say, moderate religious leaders. And it shows like working with moderate religious leaders who have an understanding of women's looking for the champions among uh, religious leaders and cultural leaders and traditional leaders, looking at them and making them leading by example so that they show their peers other possibilities up are there. That's one thing. The other experience we have is um, going deeply into the scripts of, for example, the, 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 the cultural, um, yeah, let's say you're an Islamic context, you go deeply into the Quran and see, is it really in the Quran or is that a, something that people think mm -hmm. it is in the Quran, but it's not in the Quran, but it's a pre-Islamic thing that has been there. So educating people about and taking Islamic scholars who explain the meaning of and the role of women in, in modern Islam, instead of going back to an Islam that doesn't even exist. So that is also something that helps. But again, it is making coalitions with those who have influence on those you want to influence. The mm -hmm. last point I want to make is there's a limit to working with moderates because the hardliners are the problem. So how you can sort of get those who can influence them and engage them. And the other thing is for women also just also doing their thing. I have seen women in um, Southern Libya that have just requested to be part of the negotiations there and they were ignored. What they did, they built up a tent and just prepared tea. They were just offering tea. And everybody came into that tent by the women and because they all wanted to drink tea. I mean, five days later, they were all sitting together and the women were there and they all forgot about that they had excluded the women. So it's also taking space, claiming space, but doing it in a clever way. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, I should think about the place where we, we can put such tent in Poland. Now oh, we have some places, definitely. I have a question actually for uh, Helen Kokarinen, uh, because you mentioned that male and female negotiators may bring different viewpoints to the table. Yes, you also mentioned that, of course, still negotiators need specific skills in order to be successful negotiators. And based on your experience as negotiator who negotiated in various countries, in various contexts, what skills should a successful nego negotiator have, do you think? Yeah, you mentioned one, cultural sensitivity. Is there anything else that comes to your mind? Yeah, so that first of all that, well, we have two, two eyes, we have two ears, but only one mouth. And that means that we should be able to listen. We should be able to, to see and not to just to talk and talk and talk by ourselves. So this is something that uh, what I was all the time reminded myself because I'm quite talkative coming from the eastern part of Finland. So I was reminding myself that remember to listen, remember to notice what is happening on. So this is the skill to listen. To understand and then of course that you really need to have a lot of information behind you and especially both in 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 kosovo and in ukraine i understood that i need to understand my own history the history of finland so that i can put in some kind of perspective the issues so these were at least the two ones to be able to listen to notice every, everything and then to know your own history and culture. Yeah, actually, so at least. actually, I work as a clinical psychologist, as I've mentioned, yeah, and that's also the key issue, yeah, to learn how to listen. I've learned for many years and still I know I have a problem with this. It really <laughs> takes time to learn to listen. And I have yeah. also a question to Dr. Liri Birishan. And you talked about uh, that we need a fair ratio of women and men in Albania in all areas of life, especially in politics and society. But what efforts do you think are needed in Albania to ensure this fair ratio of women and men and also to involve women in matters of national security that you've mentioned is ne it's needed, yeah? <laughs> Take pack, put it in a pile, 
për bashkjetesën, për problemin e bashkjetesës fetare. Unë vi nga një vënd ku egzistojnë disa fe, dhe bashkjetesa fetare ka qënë edhe në kohën e diktaturës një nga misionet që i ka shërbyrë gjithmonë shpirtit, i ka shërbyrë të arthmes, dhe që nga jo kohë e sot, ne jetojmë në një bashkjetes fetare do thoja të admirushme. Ka martesa me disë feve të ndryshme dhe nuk kemi konflikte fetare në vëndin tonë. Kjo besoj se është një vlerë e popullit tonë, e cila duhet qmuar dhe është qmuar gjithman. Përsa i përket raportit të drejt të barazis gjenore, ne gjim në një diktatur e fort, e cila edhe një qofë se e ka vënë gruan në një pozicion drejtusi, gjithmon e ka vënë në një pozicion drejtusi honorifik, jo profesionalisht të ngritur, një grua e cila ka qënë honorifike, sepse ka qënë e besush me ati sistemi. Gruaja në kohën e diktaturës nuk ka pas vëndin e merituar, Në mbas rënimit të diktaturës, barazia gjinore ka qënë një nga temat e cila është trajtuar në mënyrë të vazhdushme në gjdo në gjdo po. Sot, mbas ka që vitesh, ne kemi një ndryshim të math të raportit gjinore. Kemi gati-gati barazim në parlament të grave politikane me burat politikane. Kemi në drejtim kryetare parlamenti, kemi zëvëndës kryeministre, me një fjalë gratë sot në Shqipëri, në raport me burat, ka një ngritje dhe një barazim e cila nga viti në vit për ndryshon si raport. Thank you so much. I hope everyone could find the English channel in case you do not speak Albanian. If not, I can uh, briefly uh, say that uh, uh, Dr. Liri Birisha actually mentioned some historical context, but also showed that now actually position of women in Albania is actually quite good, especially there are many women in politics in leading positions. So, We've had, I think, a very inspiring session. I wish we could have had more time because I personally would like to hear much more from each one of you. I've heard here so many interesting points. I actually have many notes for myself. So I would like to thank now all of our participants. I hope we'll meet sometime again in the future and we'll have a chance to continue this discussion. But now I think it's time to end this session and to give the floor to our colleagues from the next session. So thank you so much. All the best.